I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sain uh, Nakatura. Where? Ah, there you are. Sorry. Um, uh, from Kyoto University, um, Sain Nakamura is, a, is at the Center for the Study of Contemporary India at Kyoto University. She recently submitted a congratulations, her doctoral thesis. Um, um, I won't pronounce this in Hala, but this is a, it's a Varithi Nivas, Home for Elders in Sri Lanka, an Anthropological Study on Aging and Support in Institutional Settings. Um, she's done research on aging, death, and care in Sri Lanka since 2007. Um, she's conducted field work in a high plain rural village, a coastal urban community, and lastly, in an institution central to her paper today, where she was accommodated as a volunteer floor staff. Her publications include Communicative Body, Ethnography of an Old Age Home in Sri Lanka, uh, Death, Dying, and Care in Institutional Setting, Don in the Philanthropic Elders' Homes in Sri Lanka, and Formation of Philanthropic Elders' Homes in Modern Sri Lanka, Indigenization of Charity with the Introduction of Don. Uh, so thank you very much for all coming here and uh, to the organizers, from Chris Booth's books, uh, I learned a great deal. <laughs> and today I was really delighted to come here, um, though I feel slightly jet lagged. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> so today's presentation is based on my PhD thesis, and it's actually an extract uh, from uh, one chapter of this thesis. And this, um, I will today focus on um, the end of life here, and uh, people who are approaching death and those tending to their physical needs. And I try to capture a kind of ethical moment there, which was at first like quite hard for me to comprehend. And so, and my discussion here is mostly uh, based on uh, the conversation between four staffs who are mostly girls in their twenties, um, with whom I share part of my life and my work. Okay, so I just read. Um, so what does it mean? What does it mean to treat someone ethically in a clinical situation of dying? How do we recognize the suffering of the other, especially one is unable to express himself? This issue regarding the treatment of frail, aging body was first taken up by a series of nursing home ethnography models in the United States. And these studies revealed how the bureaucratic or market-driven care practices in the modern society have allowed the older people to be denied of their dignity as persons and to be treated as objects or lifeless things long before their physical death. On the other hand, parallel to this move was the slow but gradual penetration of uh, and what person-centered approach in the medical practices around disease, aging, and death. As Sharon Kaufman argues, the idea um, uh, that the patient is an experiencing person, someone with a deep psychic interior who lives in and is shaped by a social <coughs> world and who must articulate needs, desires, and an identity had developed since 1950s in American psychiatry and psychology influenced <coughs> by Freud's work. Patients, uh, patients now had a voice within the medical discourse. The patient was now the patient as present. Um, and, uh, and older people too, even though uh, um, they are not, you know, they were not patients. Uh, since old age came to be viewed as the effects of disease process on the body, were no longer seen to be nor allowed to be the dying persons. They were um, now treated solely as patients, as persons as well, who awaits their needs and feelings to be comprehended and responded. And um, as okay, so, and as we can see today in practice, and of, uh, also in numbers of literature on the issue of end-of-life care, this concept of patient as person actually shaped the way we as individuals engage with others. For example, uh, me engaging with my uh, grandma, uh, grandmother. Uh, or those approaching death. And um, we are encouraged to, or cannot help, but uh, we are encouraged to desire for what is best for the, this patient uh, by listening to or inferring his or her needs and feelings and by trying as much as possible to respond to it. This is how we, uh, in ordinary lives, we imagine ethical attitude towards dying, how that uh, might be. Um, Okay, so however, this ethical envisaged as such was rarely observed where, where I conducted my fieldwork. 
And moreover, it seemed rather odd uh, to expect this version of the ethical from people in the condition where death was not only inevitable, but also was imagined to be the only viable resolution to the resident's suffering. Uh, this presentation therefore seeks to ask the following question, such as how might ethics look like when the dying is simply a lot to be dying person, not as patient as person? Or how might care look like when it envisions and accepts the brute reality of dying? So here I turn to the caress uh, here I turn to the definition <coughs> of care as held by Lisa Davis. I just learned that her supervisor was Professor is going, <laughs> and that it is the care as a way someone comes to matter and the corresponding ethics of attending to the other who matters. And I ask, how is it possible that the dying other, uh, and in this case, dying stranger, because it is uh, the stranger, destitute olders who are cared, uh, tended to by these um, young girls, is neither seen as think to the, the, the dying stranger is neither seen as thing to be managed, nor as one, one who is awaiting for salvation of, of their voices, but simply comes to matter and what sort of ethics we may see arise therein. So let us now turn to ethnographic account. Okay, so in Sri Lanka, most of older people live with their children or spouse at home. So spending one's whole age in institution is very, uh, very exceptional, controversial uh, phenomenon. However, they are slowly on the rise now, and today there are roughly 300 elders home in Sri Lanka. Uh, and um, most of the people who live there um, uh, have neither familiar nor adequate stock state support, and they live in um, um, non-paying homes where they and one of these homes is the Moratua home, which I show in the slide, uh, situated on the southwest coast of Sri Lanka. It is a large institution, as you can see, administered by a local service organization. It has several huge common rooms. Uh, I show some pictures. This is a common room, and um, and uh, with a small bungalow type annexes, accommodating accommodating about 150 old people and 20 staffs. Uh, after visiting this home for months, conducting interviews with the residents, I was accepted, uh, fortunately accepted as a volunteer staff, and was given an accommodation in the premises together with nine female floor staffs, uh, which gave me a good chance to participate in observation. This article actually emerged from anxieties that I experienced during this field work, especially at a place called Sick Room, where bedridden and dying residents spent their last days. And here's a picture of uh, one of the sick rooms in this institution. Uh, in the course of my study, I had somehow learned to handle the work of assisting meals, excretion, and bathing with the help from other floor staffs. But clinical situation there kept disturbing me that I was not a, um, and that I was not accustomed to natural process of decay and dying was truly one reason for this bafflement. Um, end of life care was done through oral feeding alone. Uh, and several weeks after we changed to liquid meals, like two, two weeks after we changed to liquid meals, death was inevitable. And also because of the constant lack of uh, time and labor, it was rare that we were around at the time of their death. But what, perp what perplexed me the most was the floor staff's response, their response to the suffering of dying residents. Floor staffs often told that they, these residents were pitiable having to go through a hard time apart from their family. Uh, and right in front of these, uh, these frail residents, they repeatedly stated, it's not worthwhile living like this. Such statements seem to be a justification of their indifference and um, disregard in a situation conditioned by lack of resources and uh, perhaps lack, lack of effect. However, during the field work, particularly after witnessing a strong emotional response uh, of a floor staff to the suffering of a dying resident, I, I gradually realized that their response or attitude needs to be examined in depth. So here's the event. Um, it was March, a very hot and humid season. Perhaps because of the weather, many residents were approaching death. Three male residents and two female residents were being fed liquid diet, unable to swallow well. One such resident was a male resident called Gamagesi, as he stands for grandfather and Sita. And that's the way how uh, floor steps uh, called him. 
underneath his bed, Agama Hiesia's bed, was a spittoon, like a small spittoon, to cough out his phlegm, which was relentlessly disturbing him. One evening, as I entered the kitchen, I saw Nilanti, she is one of the floor staffs, and uh, working at the home for eight years, uh, who was just to get married and leave the institution. And I saw Nilanti sitting and talking with an elder flo uh, older floor staff in the pantry. As soon as Nilanti took notice of me, she related what she had witnessed. When Nilanti went to feed Gamagizia, he had been lying on the floor. It seemed that he had tripped over his spittoon. He was smeared with his phlegm, and the whole room was filled with filthy odor. As she talked, her eyes were filled with tears. Then she said to me, right before my marriage, I felt despair with life. I am fed up with life. I kept silent for a while. Another step told me to go back to my room. So this was the first time I witnessed a strong emotional response of the four steps to the suffering of dying residents. After this, after this event, I started listening to Nilanti and her police, uh, other four steps, to understand what uh, her world really meant. And as, as I gathered narratives of the steps, I was expo exposed to a new understanding on the relationship between the four steps and the residents in the home. So Nilandi told that she was fed up with life, that she felt despair with life. Her emotion was it was expressed in the world uh, word kalakirima, kalakirima, and this uh, this kalakirima, the word kalakirima etymologically is derived from the words uh, kala and kriya, um, literally meaning the termination of time, which is death. Um, but, uh, however, in its popular form, it refers to a sense of hopelessness or despair with life. So basically. But why, uh, why at all? Uh, why did she feel? Uh, why did she feel karakirima? I s s me and and is Nilanti. I asked the other day when Gamagisiya fell down. You told me that you felt karakirima. Could you tell me why you felt like that? Mm -hmm. She answers, I feel karakirima here because of the suffering Duka, which Ajila, the grandmother, is and Thea, the grandfathers here have to go through. To me, it is very difficult to bear their suffering. Just a glass of them makes me feel so sad. Um, here, let us think what she means by telling to me it's very difficult to bear their suffering. Why did she have to bear their suffering at all? Now I ask, uh, why do you feel karagirima when you see them suffer? She answers, when you get old, Sai, you say that people turn out to be like little kids. In our home, too, it happens. When Aji and Sia behave like kids, we get upset at once and school them. At such time, I, what I feel is that I am also aging. As I get older and if I turn out to be such a state, I wonder if I could ever bear that situation. Probably I cannot. When I feel that I cannot face such a situation, I feel despair with life. From her statement, it is clear that it's not that she was feeling helpless because she was incapable of, of relieving their suffering, as I was. To put it simply, what made her fit up with life was projection of the resident's suffering of aging and decay onto herself. Um, awareness, uh, such awareness <coughs> of one's fate to age and die was considered a desirable attitude to be nurtured among the four steps, regardless of religion, although Buddhism talks about aging and death as a core of its uh, doctrines. Uh, here uh, is a Kanchana, uh, who is a Roman Catholic staff, once told me that, Though we are without ailments, today we will be frail like them, can't see, can't walk, and speak out. Um, why uh, we will be like them sometime, how can we laugh with them, etc., etc. We won't be as young as today for long, we will pass into this last worst condition. This if we keep in mind, we can work at home as long as we want. But it's important to know that Nilanti was not only referring to such universal suffering of aging and decay, she further said, we will certainly be as old as grandma and grandpa pa, pa, someday, won't we, Sai? And I think, what if I happen to live my la last days here at this home? What if I had to come to this place when I think like this at the very same? So Nilanti here is not only talking about universal truth of aging, but also is referring to her possible fate that she might be spending her old age and death in an institutional setting as at this home where she lives and works now. Um, there are at least two reasons why she, why she feels very sad when she thinks she might come to this home. One is that life in home is not easy, as Nilanti told me. Most of the time everyone seeks to, uh, see, seeks to stay cheerful, but it's not easy to <coughs> have this hunter of life in such a place as this. Eat and sleep, eat and sleep. 
this routine, routine makes them put up. You can freely, you cannot freely go out on your own. We only take them to temples, churches, or hospitals. Even if, even if you try to talk with other people, only a trivial misuse of word can lead to quarrel. You wait and wait for your family to visit you, but no one is really coming and feel so lonely. Little by little, your mental state gets worse. Another reason is that if one is uh, to one, if one is to enter but if this home. It means that one has to live with the past that ha that hurts a lot. So she says, these elders are recondite impenetrable. The, uh, you know, good type. I couldn't find a good word for this, but they have many things undisclosed. Take Purinona, for example. It's been long since she came here, but now she is not capable of communicating with others. Uh, none of us know about her property, brothers or sisters, etc., etc. Now there's a reason for her silence. She refuses to talk about them. If you start talking about family backgrounds, they will get upset, but living with these secret paths can lead to such symptoms as high pressure and all the time. Um, so that all the, and the, all the floor steps, including Milanti and Kanjan and all these uh, girls, had some form of family problems, mostly economic, might have added to the likeliness that they might follow similar fate as the residents. Uh, for example, all, all of the nine staffs had their father and her mother either died in war, ill in bed, or addicted to drugs and couldn't work. Also, floor staffs, matron, and a female office worker who were residing at this institution were all unmarried. And uh, some were determined that they live alone, that they chose to live alone. And although Nilanta was ready to get married even though soon, she said she might happen to live alone enter an institution, live with, them, uh, live with unspeakable past, and finally die apart from her family. Okay, so when the staff see the suffering condition of the residents overlap with their future self, their care practice was envisaged as the care they would, they would receive in the possible future. For Sinhala Buddhists, logic to support care for one's aged parents and family said the family is derived from the concept of karma, karma and retribution. For example, the logic goes, if we look after parents well, uh, such a good deal will come back to us when we get old ourselves. So that our children will look after us well. Flores test narratives displayed somewhat different but similar logic, uh, which goes, uh, when I grow old and let's say if I did not marry my fiance or was widowed and had no one to look after, and if I came to this home, the people here, the floors that's here, would treat me in the same way as I treat people here now. This really happens. Uh, or other floor steps told, if I did not marry, live my life alone, and if I turn to live here, because of the good deed that I do to the parents here, which means the residents here, those who will be here will serve me well, I think, like this. So the, here, the continuity or commonality of me, the floor staff, and you, the dying residents, provides a basis for meaningful care practices as well. In a situation which posed a challenge to their conventional cultural framework that parents should be cared by their children, mostly by the, the daughters, they had creatively adopted the logic of karma and parental care in the context of uh, context in institutional settings, thus rendered the practice, uh, practice meaningful. I want to go to a conclusion. Now, what is interest? What is interest? Uh, what interests me in the Magnetic account is that. Nilanti's body self was afflicted as if she comprehended Gamagesiya's suffering when in, a, in, in fact his suffering was solely unimaginable. That is, when she uttered the, world, uh, the, uttered the word Kalakirima and was filled with desperation, her body was afflicted by, the, uh, afflicted by suffering of another embodied being, Gamagesiya. However, at the same time, she also stated that his that his suffering stayed undisclosed and re recondite, and therefore was something she could never grasp. So how is it possible that the other's Im anima unimaginable suffering may unsettle her to such an extent that she filled this prey with life? Key here to understand this seemed to be the concept of contingency. She expressed a feeling of supposed interchangeability, in other words, feeling that the future in which I shall be placed in this situation is quite imaginable. In rendering such a subjunctive reality, this is a word from uh, Brunner, 
uh, credible, the concept of karma and retribution seem to play a crucial role. And through such logic of contingency, the dying resident's pain and suffering involved the other or otherness within oneself, placing the floor steps in uneasiness and despair, but also in continuity with the residents. Um, the recognition um, of her own vulnerability led Nilanti to conceive of her active care, the practice, as merit-making practices as well, as she stated, where she longed for her own well-being while tending to the physical needs of the dying resident. This, however, should not be understood, I think, should not be understood as egocentric self-defense, uh, that the Gamagisiya's suffering only gave, only his suffering only gave rise to fearful recognition of her vulnerability, leaving out the otherness of Gamagisiya's suffering. Because, because for Nilanti, to recognize the Gamagisiya's suffering was not to feel simply frightened or scared, <coughs> but to sense that what separates her from the dying other, uh, or the, from Gamagisiya, was something that could be blown away at any circumstance. In feeling the sense of Kalakirima, floor steps do not lose sight of the lit person in front of them. Rather, they are stilled by the sense of the depth and nearness of one's vulnerability made to face the sheer reality of life. It was such dissolution of self and a kind of hesitant but unyielding hope found therein that seemed to pose alternatives to our, under our understanding of ethical hope in encountering the dying other. So what does it do to care? Do to care. Uh, Sayakamura's very thoughtful paper offers a valuable contribution to an emerging anthropology of care. Uh, there are two directions such an anthropology has taken. On the one hand, care is often taken as a necessary condition of human relationship, as for example, the work of John Borneman on Germany, and as the core act beneath medicine and social service, as in the work of Arthur Kleinman on the USA and China. On the other hand, care is taken additionally as the ground of violence, as much as it is the ground of support. We see this in the writing, for example, of Angela Garcia on rural New Mexico, of Lisa Stevenson on the Canadian Arctic, and of Vina Das on the aftermath of the 1984 communal killings in Delhi. In the end, as Nakamura notes, citing Stevenson, this latter frame of care does not presume the subject of care, but takes that subject as it finds it. In terms of what, in a given situation, a given coming into being of the world, comes to matter. Her work looks closely at the care of the elderly among the minority of institutionalized poor elderly in contemporary Sri Lanka and discovers a persistent theme that the suffering of the marginal inhabitant of the old age home is unexpectedly borne by his or her caregiver. Uh, uh, Gamagya Sia has fallen and is covered with his own filth. The staff person responsible for his care, Nalanti, someone who might be taken at other moments in the home uh, by an outsider as callous, becomes upset and relates that, quote, I felt despair with life, I am fed up with life. She uses the word kalakarima, properly conveying a despair with life. So, I mean, in some ways, this is not an unfamiliar figure in, in the annals of gerontology that, uh, that one person appears to bear the suffering of the other when Alzheimer's becomes a public sight, for example, in this country in the 1980s and 1990s, one sees a very frequent uh, scene in the media in which it is the adult child who appears to bear all the suffering and there's not much left for the old parent. That shifts into the 2000s, where in media you start seeing the sufferer of Alzheimer's actually bearing some kind of subject, a process even in dementia care, exactly as Kaufman writes about the efforts to produce a patient as person and to push to some extent against the adequacy of the other bearing the suffering of, of the old person. But this is not the American story of the heroic child bearing the impossible suffering you know, that she, or he could not be expected to take on, but heroically does. This is a different story. It's, it's um, um, how might we think of this apparent transposition, a young woman feeling the suffering or despair of an old man marked as the suffering or despairing of his uh, lonely bodily condition. How might we think of this apparent transposition, this transference perhaps? Is it, as an earlier anthropology might have argued, an exchange of moral matter? I come to that figure because of your use of the idea of matter uh, 
from Stevenson, perhaps from Butler. The Kim Marriott famously wrote of individual persons, not patients as persons with always already given voices or selves, but rather persons constituted through flows of bits of matter and morality he saw as the basic units of a non-dualistic Hindu ontology, units he called coded substance. Marriott termed his analysis a bio-moral one. Is there anything useful in his analysis now for better and for worse considered passé, for its generality and a historicism, for all of the problems of its anthropology, um, uh, if it is applied to a contemporary Sri Lankan hospital? I don't know. It's, um, this despair was not the generalized despair that a pathetic old age has classically signified in Buddhism and that marks the origin story of the Buddha himself, as we see in the paper. It is marked that is not by a generality of human suffering, but by an all but unbearable state, Dr. Nakamura calls contingency. The isolation and loneliness of Gamagesia could never be entirely prevented by creating relations of family and friendship, or by saving money, or by any other means. Some people, despite their hopes and their preparations, are abandoned by their children, or lose them, or are left alone. This really happens, one care worker tells Nakamura. Or rather, this might well happen. Its mood, as she notes, is subjunctive. And here she draws on the work of Yamada and Bruner. I might become like this. This is possible. Here in the space that Giddens would have called projective identification, Nakamura locates the ethics and the meanings of care. Such ethics and meanings are not universal as much as they emerge in this moment of what she terms overlap. They are tied to an ontology of karma in which present action may partially constrain uncertainty and contingency. These old people were abandoned by their children. I may someday be abandoned as well. I'm not sure how to think about karma in the context of the contingency you demand of us. And, and it's not a, I just wonder if you could help think through how, for example, questions of causality work in a contingent and a subjunctive mode. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure that's clear. It's, it's, um, it, it, um, uh, these old people were abandoned. I may one day be abandoned as well. How I act towards them might bear upon how I am treated in the future. And yet there is a limit to my ability to care. The labor demands, for example, of the job are immense with very few staff and many residents. If I read Dr. Nakamura correctly, the moral quandary of overlap of the question of how to morally act in the face of contingency is intensified by the distributive economics of labor in the home. I'm very struck by the question of the undisclosed here. Elders are continuing to embody the secret. They are gupta. Um, they cannot be known. Their voices are not legible, as the persons Kaufman argues are produced by the post-industrial clinic. And yet here, they are powerfully known analogically to the ways we may become them in the subjunctive problem of our own old age. I'll stop with one last comment, which is many years ago I wrote a review as a younger person um, of uh, the field of old age and anthropology. It's a, it's a review that won me no friends because I had that insight of a new scholar that everyone before me was, in a word, stupid. And it was, um, and I critiqued them. And one thing I critiqued in an earlier incarnation of Sharon Kaufman and in uh, Barbara Meyerhoff, a very famous anthropologist of old age, was the idea that comes up again and again in their work that someday we will become them. Mm -hmm. And the question I asked was, does this presume an ontology of age in which we will become them? In a world where, for example, to be young and female is that I may not live in my 20s, in a world where to be young and an infant is, in fact, the big question is not that we will become them, but will we become them, and what would that mean? And, it's, it's, uh, and I was very contemptuous of the anthropology that actually wrestled with the question of, are we going to become them? But this paper actually totally revisits that question in a much more interesting and important way for me mm -hmm. uh, than, than I did years ago. It, 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 it asks in the space of this contingency, in the space of the analogic, um, the space of the subjunctive, how do we confront uh, uh, old age? How do we confront it precisely in uh, a condition not of the knowability, even the demand for that voice, for our dreams of the other's person to justify our regimes of warehouse care, but rather uh, for the threat, the possibility, and the moral instruction of that voice office. I thought it was a terrific thing, but I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
maybe there's some things to uh, um, or else we could throw it. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay. Yes. Questions, comments, thoughts? Well, yes, thank you for, sorry, the very interesting. I, I wanted you know, I, I do focus on your Nilanti here uh, at that moment, you know, it's just it, uh, a moment for you now. It, my experience, you know, just personal experience with caregivers and the dying and the elderly, is that the, the caregivers tend to cultivate over time a certain kind of almost armor against that kind of feeling. In other words, because they deal with this every day, every minute, they try somehow, but yet you're saying here at certain times there's something triggers a sort of breakthrough of that. How, how common was that? How many people did you talk to? I mean, that's a, a sort of startling kind of thing because surely this person, mm -hmm. Nilanti, has spent three years working with people in a similar situation to come this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and what triggers that? And, What's the aftermath of it? Is that something that stays with them, or mm -hmm. they kind of again rebuild that sense of mm -hmm. self protectiveness mm -hmm. or something? Um, as long as we could go on with the routine work of bathing and feeding and all this sort of thing, might not happen. The, the <coughs> thing is that once in a while, uh, one patient makes you know um, like in Kamali's case. Plan or uh, maybe he um, gets uh, one of the residents gets up in, at night and uh, slips and she hits her uh, head and uh, bleeds and, um, and in other cases uh, there was a mouse uh, in this uh, institution and she uh, this this mouse bit uh, one of the residents legs so that it, it was really terrible and Though it, it's those in, those instances where these four steps really sort of show their um, despair, this, uh, this, this emotional responses. But uh, yes, it is very rare because they are accustomed to um, dealing with these people in a routine way. But um, but at the same time, this kind of feeling, uh, I could not see this kind of response from the younger, rather younger female um, four steps who are like 18 years old, 19 years old. Maybe it's Milante's experience as well. She had uh, worked here uh, uh, as long as eight years, and that's it's also her experience that brings her into such uh, intercorporeal, this, this affective um, response. This is not third, <laughs> I think, can be 
second or third, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, three of nine poor staffs in the situ uh, this institution came from orphanages. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, so these people, and, and the, this institution is served by the social, social service organization. So for the committee members who come from higher social classes, they, they, they think that um, hiring these girls is also part of their social services. Um, but this is really ironic, I mean, um, um, but these girls, because they live in dormitory and they're given and they serve food and all, they don't have to pay for their accommodation, so mm -hmm. they, uh, most of the money they get, like uh, 4,500 4, rupees in Sri Lanka rupees, which is about 10,000, I know, 9,000 Indian rupees, mm -hmm. that they get a month. And, um, and they send it to their family to, to help them. So it's a way of earning this money, but it's not easy. And, um, and this is, um, is low paid. Like it's it's actually almost the same as the no it's lower than the those uh, working at free trade zone much lower so I think um, yes it is but uh, recently there is a um, policy on the, the, the government policy <coughs> which started this um, system of uh, home nursing service mm -hmm. in a low cost at a low cost because there are so many um, people the demands because uh, the many of the, fe the, fe the female the mothers and you know, they, they in Sri Lanka, um, female go up maybe go abroad to the Gulf mm -hmm. or you know to a free trade zone or Colombo to work and um, so in uh, in the noon time, old people are left alone. So for those people, you know, there's a demand, a lot of demand for looking after this old people. <coughs> So and they're starting to you know s give certificate to the social workers who may be hired as um, the home nursing, um, home nursing nurse. So it might change in the future. Yeah, my question is also about the social background of uh, this uh, caretaker mm -hmm. and uh, yes, uh, class and gender mm -hmm. and uh, education background. Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, your conclusion is quite universal to me. <coughs> but um, to, to think about the care, that the, for example, if we look at, at the Japanese case now, the Japanese uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, old person's home uh, the service is outsourcing to the, the sometimes to the South, South East Asian people to invite them <laughs> and to take care. <laughs> And uh, so uh, um, um, uh, the feeling or the ethics mm -hmm. may be different mm -hmm. uh, uh, from one situation to another situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I'd like to know that much more about the uh, Nilan social background or mm -hmm. why she, she chooses to be um, capable. Uh, okay, yeah. so from complete uh, this yeah. case or, of Nilan. Or, 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 or is there any Real Sri Lankan uh, 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 features, characteristics, or the ethics of the KFP. Oh, okay, so um, I think it's really uh, it's not it's hard to generalize this uh, this ethics uh, the, the ethical that I have described in this paper <coughs> uh, because it has a lot to do. It's mediated um, by such concepts as karma or kalakirima, and also this, the, the, the physical um, environment in this particular institution that, um, you know, there's maybe the mice, mice biting, or it's, it's uh, uh, there's a concrete, and, you know, the discipline, you know, if, if, you, if you are slippery, and all these physical environment of the institution is also, you know, it's part of the, um, what causing this situation. So it's really um, um, hard to, it's not, I, I didn't mean to generalize it, but to pose a, a, a counter, uh, a counter a, it's opposed to a, a alternative to um, uh, really generalize and universalizing uh, discussion on, of care. Uh, and, uh, so, and uh, 
as for the case of Nuanti, um, yes, uh, she wanted to be a doctor. And she, um, she wanted to be a doctor, and she uh, was going through, she went past an uh, O-level test, an O-level test exam, and she wanted to go for an A-level exam, and when she was waiting for this exam, her father died. And that's when she had to change her dream, she had to start working, and that's when, okay, so she, she thought there was an um, um, ad which, um, for the home nursing, uh, apprenticeship. So she was not paid much, but uh, she could uh, work as a medical sort of staff and being paid. So she chose to be a uh, home nursing staff. But it was contract for one year. So after this one year contract, she had to search for another job, and that was this one. Mm -hmm. So she had some um, hope to to for the care, you know, to do the care practices for these um, destitute people, the, uh, the older people, etc. But it was not her initial dream, and it was she, what she initially wanted to be. So, it, it, and you know, this, this unfortunate situation, her father's death and um, her mother's illness and all these things because she was the first in her uh, in the family and that's all contributed to her being the four step. The discussion, I think, inter, uh, intercorporeality in this paper, but I didn't, I couldn't do that this time. But um, we need to think about intercorporeality if we, when we think about the subjunctive reality that they're experiencing. So uh, it's not only about the logical, you know, logically living others' fate. It's it's not logical thing alone. It's, it's really body, bodily, in, embodied experience, on the, in, and. Um, and this has to do with the smell that she smelled, the, the odor of the, the filthy odor of the, the, the room, and you know that the, the visual sight, and all these things, you know, it has to be a, pa a part of ethnic ethnographical writing to, to for us to understand what really happened to her body. And it, it's really a my, my, you know, I have to do that further. <laughs> yes. One quick thing, and we'll, you know, but it's your point is well taken, and that, in that sense, I want to withdraw my claim that this is analogical mm -hmm. because you're pushing against the adequacy of a logical frame, and you're arguing that uh, there's something. It still brings me back to that earlier moment, which you're doing very differently, that is through Marriott, where there was some kind of claim that that value has to happen even through the body, the, uh, that morality. Uh, is not some kind of uh, abstracted frame, but always has to happen through the intimate conditions of, as you put it, intercorporeal relations. I mean, he was just trying to systematize them in, in the context of an ahistorical India, and that's where it sort of fell apart, arguably. But it's 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 um, the the um, but you're doing something in a different way in a contemporary idiom. It's, it's, it, this is McKim Marriott, who uh, was uh, an anthropologist who. Uh, well, we can talk about it after, but it's it's but he he made this claim for for uh, that in fact the question of the ethical had to happen through uh, the body, but it had to happen through exchanges between bodies, and those okay. exchanges were somehow built into the structure of a person in a given mm -hmm. world. But it's 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 um, 
But again, what you're doing is not that. I, don't, I guess the other question I have is that we tend to produce this account of the, or I'm not sure, of the intracorporeal, mm -hmm. particularly in certain situations, mm -hmm. in the nursing home, mm -hmm. around death. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe you say no. On the contrary, it's around the child. It's around the, the, the she mm -hmm. thinks about her own. Mm -hmm. But it's it's. Um, is there something specific to the kinds of the topos of old age, the situation mm -hmm. of old age, the situation of the nursing home, the very poor nursing home? Mm -hmm. That because if I think of my own work as a floor staff to get access mm -hmm. to a nursing home, mm -hmm. like you, I mean, mostly what I did was what sociology about bed and body work. I was mm -hmm. cleaning body. people's bodies. I was. I was deeply, you're absolutely right, I was, my hands, my nose, my whole being was deeply into someone else's mm -hmm. abjection, their mm -hmm. filth, their mm -hmm. dependency. Mm -hmm. But it was a deeply embodied mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think how much you're pushing us towards a general understanding mm -hmm. of ethics through the body, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or how much this is a very specific intervention around late life abjection. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's clear. Yes. Yes, I want to, I, let me think about it. In the, but, um, you know, this, this really, I also did field work in households. And uh, those households who, they, where there were uh, older parents who are approaching them. And as uh, you, uh, in your book, uh, there was a word, um, um, familial body. So the, the dying body, the old age, parents who were dying was um, conceived of as a family, yes, and I think that exactly was the case in Sri Lanka as well, I mean, it, there there was this body, and it all, you know, it was the issue of the family, and uh, but there was no, uh, as far as I have seen, there was no such unsettling moment, because it was, it Everyone was you know, sure that he is approaching, she, is, she or he is approaching this, we need to feed him if we wanted to, you know. So, so they were much less unsettling than the case in this institution. So, um, you know, and I'm, okay, so this is different thing, but now I'm raising a small kids. And after I submitted this thesis and thought on the issue of care, uh, and intercorporeality, and I started raising my child, uh, caring for my own child, and it, it happened, it occurred to me that, okay, this is not only about aging, but some part of it is actually <coughs> about aging, and we, we need to, sort of, you know, the, the care, um, much of the literature on care in the United States, as far as I know, is um, mostly it's on child care. And uh, the, um, whether, whereas in Japan, it's almost on the aging care. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but um, well, I really want to think more about it, you know, that the relationship with the, be, between the generation and what is it that we care about them, what, what is it that we, that makes us, you know, makes him matter to me, uh, what is body doing there, it's, it's all a lot of questions that I need to one last question. Oh, sorry. Oh, one last quick question. Apart from the social background of Vedanta, uh, does it have something to do with uh, at age also? And when we're young, when we are upward curve, we do not have that kind of feeling. And when we start, you know, to be perhaps downward curve and our body, our own body starts failing us somewhere, perhaps that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, when I returned from this field work and I started reading more about the Japanese literature on this subject, I found out that in the, the, the um, daughters, the um, daughter-in-laws, you know, they take care of the, the parents, the aged parents in Japan, and they, in their uh, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, they also share some sort of this eth ethics with Nilanti, which means that they see similar sort of fate in them, and they're unsettled, you know, it's, it's really unsettled by this, you know, in the process of caring for these parents. So I think it's more familiar, you know, when I started this, when I was doing this field work, I was um, 24, 25, and I was 
it didn't, I, you know, this sort of idea didn't come into my mind at all. And Nilanti was a bit older to me, but she was in the same generation. I was really surprised that she experienced this kind of, you know, uh, continuity with the age uh, residents. So it might be the case that if you grow older and older, this ethical might be seen similar, uh, familiar than, you know, it in, uh, than now for me as well. But um, it, I think, yes, it, it has something to do with generation as well. But in, yes. Mm -hmm. so please join me in thanking uh, Sayadaw.